I run the marketing for TPM as an example. If I leave, can somebody else come in immediately and take over? Can someone take over without too much disruption? Uh, and if we were to double, it's, it's a yes, no situation. It's not, well, you know, they could, but that to me is a no. Now you have a scalability issue. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the TPM Show. We are back and today we're gonna talk about scaling. Is it scale or fail? So overcoming the growing pains of business expansion, something a lot of us have felt. And here at TPM, we are a movement. Uh, you can consider us a business, but we are on trajectory to do a 10X this year. We're on track for that. And Tim and I wanna to talk to you about some of the things that we've looked at to, so you can be ready to take your business to the next level and not be scared of the hurdles that inevitably you're going to face. Tim and I have done this multiple times. Between the both of us, we've done this with many, many businesses. We want to talk to you guys about, as business owners, what you can do to grow and scale your business. So, Tim, some of the take-homes I want to talk about is how to identify when and how to scale your business and the importance of systems, processes, and team scaling, as well as balancing growth while maintaining the quality and culture. Does that work for you? Yeah, it does. So, you know, as I said, here at TPM this year, we're on pace for a 10x growth um, within the movement. And really, it's because of the men. I love to say it's our, our great work, but we actually have amazing men that are coming here. But you also got to realize, listeners, that the people that work within TPM, um, most are old business owners. When I say old, they're not old by age. But their men have gone through our programs in the movement who have been business owners. So they take a very intrapreneur, like an entrepreneur within a business approach to things. Oh, sorry. You cut out on the final point there, Doug. No, no worries. I was just stopping to give you an opportunity to talk. I've had a lot of coffee. <laughs> um, yeah, we do. Uh, we have a lot of uh, amazing people on the team, like you said, who used to be... Uh, I hate the word clients because it's not how we view the men in the movement, is it? But for lack of a better word, I'll call them clients. A lot of people on the team that used to be clients. And uh, like you said, because it did have such an impact on their life, they just reached a point in their own career as well where they were tired of just making money for the sake of making money, right? Part of them going through the program opened their eyes up to what was really possible for them and how much they wanted to do something meaningful in the final 10 to 15 years of their career. Um, so yeah, some of them chose to come on board and they've been pivotal, pivotal in helping the movement to impact the number of kids and men and families that it's impacting today. Yeah. So the first thing that I look at, Tim, when I'm looking at is a business rate of scale is what is the feedback I'm getting for on the product or service that I have? Is it ready? In other words, is it good enough? And what I mean by good enough so we have an anonymous feedback system. So if anybody that goes through our programs, they get sent uh, a survey, which they fill out anonymously. So they can answer as honestly as they'd like. And we have over a 90% success rate with the programs. That's huge, right? Men love the coaching, right? The coaches, uh, I want to say at a scale of five, Tim, I think you know the exact number, but I'll, I'll go. I think we have a 4.9 out of five rating. Mm -hmm. Uh, for the last program that we did. So we look at this, you have to have a product or service that it, that it is worthy of scaling. Do people want this? Does it work? Does it provide the service that you say it's going to be? So if you run a marketing agency, are you able to get leads or um, brand recognition for your clients? It's a yes, no question. I was talking to a guy earlier, Tim, who runs an agency and he asked me, he said, Hey, I think I'm ready to scale. I said, great. I go, how long have you had your clients? Like, how long do they stick around for? He's like, Oh, well, you know, we have really high turnover. Well, why is that? Mm. Well, Doug, you know, we actually, when it comes down to it. People just end up leaving us. And so when I ended up talking to him, Tim, he wasn't ready to scale because he didn't have a product or a service that actually worked. And that was the problem. And he realized that really his focus wasn't shouldn't be on scaling. It should be going back to home base mm -hmm. and coming up with a service, in his case, that actually helped people so much that they wanted to stick around. Mm. Yeah, scaling is like the sexy thing to do, isn't it? But it can be absolute chaos if it's not done on the right foundation. 
and that third takeaway you had in the beginning you now how to how to do it with a little bit of balance both i think an important piece as well is how to do it without sacrificing your health your happiness and your relationships because if you scale if you add flaws to a building with crumbling foundations before you know it, you might be thinking that you're spinning plates now <laughs> you choose to scale from that place of instability and you can multiply that by 10 and it's going to be absolute chaos i think it can be i think there's also seasons right so transparently with me within tpm i gained a bunch of weight over this last year but that's because my whole focus was on growing the movement, which is so important to me. I mean, when you're in a position that I'm in and you literally have men coming to you and saying, you saved my life or you saved my family on a regular basis, it's, <laughs> it's hard not to want to dive in fully to that and sacrifice yourself mm. a little bit. Um, I can speak for myself, but I'm guessing I'm speaking for a lot of men. Like we sacrifice ourselves a lot. It's our default. It's certainly something I'm always working on because I'm always willing to sacrifice fight myself, give you the shirt off my back, even though I'm freezing. Um, I think a lot of us are that way. And if you know it's for a season, then I think that's okay. Right. I think that's okay. Like right now I'm pulling back on a lot of things, focusing back on my wellness. Um, so you do want that balance unless you're deciding, Hey, look, this is the time to scale. This is the time to grow. Then in which case you have a conversation with those you love around you. I talk to you about this. I talk to people on the team. I talk to my wife. Uh, I let them know like, Hey, I'm putting my head down and, and I'm getting this stuff done so we can get to this end game, but it's for a short period of time. Right. And to me, a short period of time is less than two years or two years or so. Right. That's, a, that's in business. That to me is a short relative span to get to this point. And so I think for a season, that's great. Um, but you want to maintain to your point, Tim, the quality or mm -hmm. you cannot let go of the quality, in my opinion, just to scale, right? Because if that goes down, you've lost your business. It's a short term, short term win for a long term loss if your quality goes down. Yeah, I'm with you um, on all of what you just said. I think for most guys, it's not a season. It's, it's the path of force. It's very different for you. Um, you know, you're still on the path of power. Right, even though you may have may look different at times, for a lot of the listeners, the vast majority, no disrespect to those guys, the reality is they'll be on the path of power, and it and it won't. They'll be scaling. I'll just be. That's just the way they operate, right? That kind of um, hustle mentality, which is is I love. And <laughs> there's so many strengths in it, um, but it's when it takes over them and it comes at the cost of everything. Um, but yeah, to your point, if you scale and you lose the quality in the product, which goes back to the original point, right? Do you have a product that's even ready to scale? Well, if you retention rate or whatever, uh, it's called for in your particular business is low, then of course not, right? You get to get the foundation and make sure the foundation is solid enough. It doesn't need to be perfect. It needs to be good enough so that you're actually adding flaws and it can hold the building up. Whereas... Now, I've seen many business owners um, who have chosen to scale without having the basics in place. And they've gone from, I think one guy in particular went from, I think, about 40 employees to about 100 in the space of the past 12 to 18 months, scaling in the way that he's chosen to scale, which uh, is terrifying to me the way he's chosen to do it because... Um, there's just no, there's no optics on anything. There's no clarity on anything. As a result, if you imagine a circle with loads of arrows pointing in different directions, that's what you've got. Now, if there's 15 of those arrows, it's manageable. A hundred of those arrows becomes a bit like chaos, which uh, as business owners, we tend to have the mindset of, okay, I'll just do it. Imagine <laughs> having that mindset with a hundred people. I'll just do it. I'll swoop in. It, it, it becomes crazy. So, um, I think the product is a key piece for me. You know how much I'm a big fan of diagnosing and alleviating constraints. In an ideal world, if I was to look at whether a business was was ready to scale or not, I would be able to see a set of numbers, not many numbers, but you know, 10 to 15 numbers I can think of off the top of my head that give a good indicator. One of those would definitely be a retention rate or customer lifetime value or frequency, whatever it may be to see how loyal and happy that, uh, customer is right and then from there if, if let's assume the product is ready to scale 
cool. How would you then go about scaling it? Is it a lead issue? Is it, what is it that you need more of? Which those numbers ought to be able to tell you. Yeah, I love that sheet. I love that train of thought. I think before I get there for, for my train of thought, Tim, is, um, you know, we have a show in the States called Shark Tank. You have Dragon's Den in the UK. Mm-hmm. There's a guy in Shark Tank, Kevin O'Leary. Love him or hate him. He's got this line that he uses a lot of, you know, what happens if you get hit by a bus? Then the mm. business is over, right? And this comes down to, are all the people on your team replaceable? Because you can't scale otherwise. Otherwise, that's what comes up as the bottleneck. Most often, it's the owner or the CEO who are trying, an owner CEO is even worse. They're trying to just do too much, right? Because their hands are in the middle of everything. Um, you know, there's ego involved. Mm. There's all kinds of, I can do it better stories, as you were just saying. So really, when you're looking at that from a scaling perspective, you know, and this happened on our leadership team today uh, with somebody, uh, you know, what was asked was, hey, look, you have this knowledge in your head. What happens if you leave? right? No disrespect, that knowledge is lost. And so you need that to be able to scale up because if we, if you, let's say we're selling uh, coffee cups, right? Whatever. And we went from selling 5 million to 10 million. We want to double. Well, we need more, what's going to happen? We need more people, right? How are we going to scale up the people and the resources to package the cups, to pour whatever uh, aluminum this is or whatever you get into the machines? Who's going to repair them? Right? We have Frank doing repairs, but now we're doubling our process. We're going to need another Frank. How do we train somebody? How do we onboard them? What are our interview processes? What's our recruitment process? You know, I had this great uh, mentor. I've told you the story a lot, Tim, named Bill when I was in my early 20s. He said, Doug, you always have to have a B team. You always have to have a B mm-hmm. team on the sidelines that you can recruit from. And that's something you and I have been working towards. Uh, but you need to make sure that the people and processes can run without you and without the actual people in them. And what I mean by that is uh, I run the marketing for TPM as an example. If I leave, can somebody else come in immediately and take over? Can someone take over without too much disruption? Uh, And if we were to double, is that, is that's a yes, no situation. It's not, well, you know, they could, but that to me is a no. Now you have a scalable, you have a scalability issue. And that needs to be taken uh, into consideration, I think, before you get to the diagnosing and fixing constraints. Uh, but that's the next step in my book. Mm. Well, yeah, it's like if you've got customers leaving you, you have staff leaving you as well. Yeah, this this one particular yeah. person who um, had the the example I just gave, the arrows in the circle went from uh, 30 odd, 40 employees to 100. Uh, high turnover of staff. And apparently the the reason, one of the reasons they gave was it's hard to find talent in the area. It's hard to attract talent to move to that area. To which I said, well, why do they have to be in the area? And as we kind of pulled it, peeled it back and back and back, and I kept highlighting, well, TPM, there's 40 odd members of staff around the world, different time zones, all with visibility, all with this. All, so it's, it's possible every rebuttal, oh, well, it can't happen because of this and this. It needs to be in person. It became clear that it would be possible for that particular position to be remote with the ability to be in person at times as well. Um, But I think you raise a key point, like is there a high turnover of staff? If so, why is it? And then really being able to uh, peel back the layers as to why. It could be culture. It could be leadership. It could be the wrong person in the beginning right which came down to the could come down to the excuse or its location Mm, in today's world uh, unless you've got a real hands-on job like you're hiring surgeons for example who have to be in in person there aren't there's a lot of things that don't fall into that category right so you can really uh, bust that particular excuse really yeah, well, something we, and we're going on we're a little tangent here, but something you and I use internally is what false assumptions are we making today? Mm. Right. And that one really serves us well, in my opinion. Like we just got back from Argentina. We hosted an event uh, over almost 50 men in total were there. An amazing event. And it's so easy to make assumptions of what the men want, 
what's going to be good, what's going to be bad, how we're going to do things, how we can't do things. Mm -hmm. We can't take that many men to a foreign country that far away and deliver a five-star experience. However, coming back, we had a report today where, again, we anonymously <laughs> pull everybody. We do this all the time because we want to be better. And unanimously, we had five out of five stars for the event, right? And we got to really question the false assumptions. And when you question the false assumptions you're making, it opens up other possibilities. Mm. And I think certain personalities naturally lend themselves to this. Certain personalities are, are much more linear, right? The more black and white stay between the lines. Um, so mm. you got to figure out where you are with that. But that's a really good one. Now, let's just say you've got a great product, right? People want it. They love it or service. They want it and love it. We check that box too. You're saying, yep, uh, mine's scalable. Now, by the way, if it's not, in other words, if your people aren't scalable, your, your processes need to be done first. That's the next step in my book, Tim. What are the processes that everybody is doing? So you use me as the head of marketing for the powerful man. What does Doug do, right? And what I would do if I was the owner uh, is I would have Doug, hey, Doug, what I want you to do is just write down everything you do every day. Just put it down in a document. And then as you do something, screen record what you're doing on the computer and talk it through. And then what I've always done with every company I've owned or been involved in is you develop a wiki, like, right? Uh, you develop a, a working document. So the next person that comes in, the next CMO that sits in the seat comes in, they can look at all the SOPs, all the processes, all you know the ways of thinking, understand them, and then they can add to them. So here's a trick. So if you have somebody, not the C-suite level, but let's just say you have somebody in an admin level, you know, whatever they're doing, maybe they're doing fulfillment for you. They're selling the mugs, right? They're doing fulfillment. And they have a wiki that they can go in and look at a process, an SOP, if you will, and understand how to actually put the mug in the box, clean it, put it in the box, package it properly, put all the, you know, the marketing brochures, ship it off, label it, get it to the UPS guy. Let's just say that's their job role. Now, every time they have a question, hey, how do I put the promo sticker in the box? Should it be facing up or facing down? When they find the answer to that question, they need to add it to the document. They need to go back to the SOP and add that question and answer to the document. And every time they ever have a question and answer, they keep doing it. So now you have a vault of living documents within your organization. They're constantly being added to. They're getting bettered, right? Every single time. You as the owner can step out of it. Now you should have someone quality control it, right? But you can look at that. And until you get to that point, you're, in my opinion, you're not ready to truly scale. You can get away with it, but you're going to have crap, you know, as you're running fast, because that's what scaling is falling off the vehicle, falling off the company all the time. And you're going to spend more time and money and resources picking up the pieces rather than getting the foundation. Mm, right. Yeah. So key, so easy for that knowledge to get lost. I think I don't know who came up with it on the TPM team, the idea of jungle knowledge. <laughs> um, just get lost, gets lost if somebody leaves. Um, yeah. Key piece, key piece. Um, one of the key things I often see, people lacking as well when uh, we're working with them, which kind of feeds into this, is just clear scorecards. When I say scorecards, I don't mean a dashboard per se or the number. Uh, just a very clear, let's say Google Doc, that outlines, has the KPI at the top, right? And then obviously their main, their very, very clear roles and responsibilities beneath it. Oftentimes I'll be given the roles and responsibilities, which paves the way to the processes, which is kind of uh, in tangent, in tandem to what you're saying there, Doug. Um, but it's I'm always surprised how many lack the KPIs for the individuals. And if they have them, how few also actually provide proper accountability over making sure that that person is actually delivering on that particular outcome. Because it's not about them being busy. It's about them being effective. And too often people get caught up in dealing with symptoms instead of root causes. And too often as well, a great question within this, which is kind of a little bit off topic, but kind of goes to the third point of leadership and culture. Um, when people are performing and they're on track with it, a question I love to ask is what's working? 
it's really important to identify for that individual to identify the root cause of what's working that's leading to them being on track because it could be something totally unrelated to work. It could be that they're going to bed earlier and they're getting up earlier and then they're getting time to work out before work and they're more productive in work. But unless you support them in really getting clear on what's working, it's hard for them to continue to reproduce it. And obviously you want them to be reproducing the good result, right? So it's very easy to drill down and focus when things aren't working. And very few people drill down and focus when things are working. It's very true that we call it the gap versus the yeah. gain, right? What's the, it's easy to look at the gap as a business owner. Uh, you're talking about focusing on the gain, which I love. What we did, I think taking a step back as I think about this, you know, this is something we've done very consciously. When we look at a 10 X growth was begin with the end in mind. Where do you want to get to? Um, you know, for us, it's all about, we calculated that the average man has two kids, let's just say, and the men that we've served last year, we served a thousand children, right? So you can do the math on how many men came through, said, Hey, I got what I came for through our initial program. Now it's just our initial program. It's not the other programs we offer. Our goal is, Hey, let's help 10,000 kids. What does that look like? And so what we did is we had this goal of 10,000 children saved, right? And that's a big goal, right? We, we save children by first saving their fathers, right? Uh, where our belief system is, is that a child is going to grow up in a better home if they have a powerful father, loving, supporting them, showing them as a role model. So then we, we work backwards. What does that look like from detailed financial forecasting, right? How many men do we get to serve? How do we get to serve them? What's our, what's our acquisition pipeline look like to serve that many men? Shoot, if we have that many men coming through the groups, how many coaches do we need, right? Mm -hmm. Where do we find these qualified coaches? We get more coaches applying to be coaches here than we can take. And we can't find enough qualified coaches that fit our parameters. So we're looking at staffing. What staff does it take to deliver this so we can maintain or increase the level of quality? I told you a 4.9 out of 5. I want it to be a 5 out of 5, right? Don't we all? 100% of the men love it. Now, you're never going to get 100%. Some of you guys are buggers and you don't give 5 stars regardless because you always see room for improvement. And I love you guys. And we want to know how do we get there? What's our marketing do? What's our detailed plan to scaling the marketing? right? People need to know about us. This podcast that we do for you guys is our way of giving back, but it's also a way of getting out there. How can we get guys to share this more, to talk about it more? What are ways in which we can do that so we can affect 10,000 children this year, which is a 10x scaling for us. So I think you really want to begin with an end in mind and then backtrack to a detailed plan, right? What is your financial forecasting? What is your staffing needs to f or fulfillment? issues how do you fulfill then what's your marketing going to be is there anything else in operations legal that needs to be done sales etc and really work backwards with a plan that could be executed because when you do that you can find gaps right away right what are those gaps that are in there for us at tpm the biggest gap that we always have is finding quality coaches because we just don't we don't hire anybody you don't you can't you have to have world-class coaches to get a 4.9 out of 5 every time when you run programs, right? We've had this for years, right? Our, our quality standards are extremely high. So that's our gap. So how do we fulfill that? And then you start working on a strategy for that element. Okay, to Tim's point, diagnosing and fixing constraints. For us, it's coaching, but maybe for you, it's a machinery or it's financial. There's something else that is your constraint to hit that 10, to hit your number, whatever else it is, as you're scaling. Great identify that constraint before it happens. And so you can work backwards to today or this week on what you can be doing to implement, to make sure that you don't run into those issues. Mm, yeah. Well said. I love uh, building out the accountability chart with the end in mind. You know, when you, the thing is <laughs> when you've got a lot of data as well, I just love the clarity. I love the clarity. You, I love geeking out on it as well. And just having that level of clarity, but it's great right? Because a lot of those seats on that chart are going to be in red. So for us, a seat on the chart in red is a question mark. It means we don't yet have anyone occupying the seat. But to your point, Doug, when we're clear or when we understand the uh, certain numbers, for example, within the advisors, the people that advise people on what, what they should do to fix the marriage, essentially, before they come into the program, uh, they have a booked ratio, 
right? That's their number. Um, we'd never want it to be 100% because they're going to burn out. There's a sweet spot that you can track to optimal performance. Equally with the coaches, there's a coaching capacity number as well. So when, you underst- when you've got these kind of metrics, whatever they are for you within your particular uh, company, it then enables you to be able to build out something like the accountability chart, understanding uh, the capacities of each indiv- each seat, really, not the person's seat. And um, then you're going to know roughly as you take that plan for the year, not only who you're going to hire, but when do you need to hire them? What are the trigger points, right? And those trigger points won't be a point in time. They'll be with certain outcomes or numbers being hit because, you know, one of the faulty assumptions that I often hear is, oh, I need, to, I need more people. Well, do you need more people? Or is it the people that you have are not being effective? But they do, you just think you need more people because they tell you you need, they need more, you need more people because they're busy. <laughs> big difference between busy and effective. Big, big difference. But without the proper, oh, yeah. uh, massive, without the proper leadership, LMA in place, leadership management accountability, um, you don't know, right? Um, so it's key to, to really have the eye on the detail there. I just, I think there's so much value in reviewing the game tips. You know, in sport, they always review the game tips. Day after the game, everyone's in, review the game tips. Um, I did it last week with uh, with a business owner. I reviewed one of his meetings, his L10. Would you, oh, no, it was an LMA call he was doing with one of his uh, members of staff. And he'd never done it before. And he was really pleasantly surprised. Like, do you, have you done that often? Do you, do you tend to do that? And he loved seeing himself in action and seeing how he delivered the leadership to that person and seeing their response because how he remembered how he conducted the LMA versus what actually happened on the LMA were very different. And when you're reviewing those game tips, not just for your own performance, but to, to track and monitor the performance of your team, it becomes very revealing as to whether they are being busy or effective. And uh, as a result, whether or not you need to hire somebody because you don't want to get trapped in the position of having a bloated team that creates a lot of chaos because you have too few of the right people. And the other thing, just while I'm talking about this, is how often we as business owners spend far too much time talking about the wrong people and nowhere nowhere near enough time talking about the right people. Yeah. Another thing that's really interesting is I've never met a manager that doesn't want more people on their team that doesn't want to hire more people. And I think you can scale yourself out of business. Mm, good point. Um, and that's why you need those financial yeah. projections and who do you need in the seat to your point? And I know you love your accountability chart, um, <laughs> is, you know, what does that look like when you're at that level? So for us at TPM, if we're going to, if we're going to save 10,000 children, how many men is that? What programs are they in? And who's delivering them? How's fulfillment? How are all the our success team? You know, we want to deliver a white glove service to the men that go through our program. We want them to have an amazing, first of all, they need to get the result. You know, they need to have an amazing experience with us as well. So we want to make this, you know, a five-star thing. So who who's who gets it to be involved in that? And that helps you. There's going to be, you know, road bumps along the way, but you know, now when you're in Q1 or at the end of Q1 as we're coming up to now, um, when, you know, your client services says, hey, I need three more people. You go, wait a minute. When we make this roadmap together, you didn't need three more people back then. What's going on? And you can start looking at it and you can look at your diagnosing and fixing constraints dashboard. It's what we use. We look at all the numbers. Think of it as a normal dashboard. But when we see a number that's off, we can drill down and find out what's going on. Uh, in traction language, it's keep it's KPIs. You drill down to the critical drivers, right? What are the things that drive those KPIs? That's super important. Another thing that's often, I think, not talked about, and this came up really big for me, Tim, at the Inner Circle Retreat. So the Inner Circle is our high-end mastermind group. They're men that have been through our program and have, have invested a significant amount of uh, resources, time, and money to be there. And so they get to stay on for private events at the end of our other events. And so they're much more intimate, much more laser-focused focused and those, those are capped out and our one-on-one clients join us too. And so at that one, what really was interesting is we had one guy who had a business situation. It was a scaling issue. 
And so he asked me and I gave him an answer. He asked another guy, a guy gave him the same answer. He asked another guy and he got a slight tweak on it. And, but it resonated, right? He, he's like, okay, I've heard the same thing three times. This makes sense. Like these are smart men. And it's the idea of iron sharpens iron. If you're getting ready to scale, surround yourself by other men who have no skin in the game, who want you to, to succeed. Now you can have a board of advisors and have people with some skin, skin in the game, but surround yourself with other entrepreneurs that are operating at a high level that can give you the insight. I do not think and do not agree that you should be with people in the same industry. I think that's a mistake that most business owners make. They think, hey, if I'm in the HVAC business, I should be surrounding myself with HVAC owners and that's it. Uh, it's good to have some industry insights. However, if you're in the HVAC business and you hang out with someone who runs, I don't know, a manufacturing plant, you're going to get insights into business that they are using that your competitors are probably having thought of, right? They're tangential. At the end of the day, business is business for the most part. Everybody's going to have a unique thing. But most of the foundations hold true. And at TPM, we started off more as a business coaching company, and that's morphed over the years. So we still apply business coaching to all the men that are in our the brother our mastermind programs that commit for a year. We do we do deep dives into business. We love talking about it. So you got to make sure you're surrounding yourself with people that you respect, people that are going to give you the no BS answers, right? The no fluff. They're going to tell it to you and shoot it to you straight here's what you need to do. Here's why I think that. And they're going to give you opinion. And ultimately as the owner, it's up to you to decide which ones you execute. Mm, I love that. In the day, you've got to trust yourself as well, which goes back to the point of just having routines. I know I didn't speak about it in the beginning, but you were talking about you know, doing what you love and um, going all in, right? Even within that, you've had points of reflection, points where you're you, know, you thrive when you're away from the computer and you got thinking time. However, that goes down, right? And um, one of the key things we give the men, ARS. Just use that as an example. But if you're scaling, you've got to have those moments where you zoom out. You just have to. Otherwise, it's very easy to get lost in the weeds. It's very easy to then lose touch with what your gut instinct is kind of telling you because you don't see things as clearly. And I think that's a huge part of this. Like you said, trusting yourself, iron sharpens iron, and being able to zoom out and zoom back in. It is. So I think at the end of the day, regardless of what you're looking at, guys, you know, if you're thinking, hey, look, I'm ready to scale. I'm ready to do this. First, you got to conduct an audit of your business. Conduct an audit of your business, also your processes, and identify the key areas of, of improvement. Plug the holes, because as you scale, those holes are just going to get bigger. Right. And that means you're going to have more volume coming through these bigger holes. Instead of having a bowl catching all the revenue and clients, you're going to have a colander with a, with a thousand holes in it and everything is going to leak through. So conduct your audit first. And the second thing I think we go with, Tim, is is have that detailed plan. Think with the end in mind and come backwards. Right. Mm -hmm. Look at your financial forecasting, your marketing. Right. Because marketing people are the best. And then your staffing issues. Think about that. How are you going to get there? And where, what do you need to do with the end in mind? What are your constraints going to be? And again, seek mentorship you know, and advice from other entrepreneurs who have done this, who have been there, done that. Not just the theoretical, right? It's one thing to read all the books. It's another thing to actually apply it and actually be in the trenches doing it time and time again. Because you just learn more, right? You just There's knowings you have when you've done this so many times that other people just aren't going to get. You know, you just have that gut feel and to know what to look for coming through. So surround, that's the number one one. Surround yourself with other like-minded individuals. Mm, I love that point. Awesome. Tim, I love this topic. I love to, I know we keep talking about to having more and more business conversations here on the podcast. And I think we should bring some more of those to the forefront. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you and I think very differently and also similarly when I think the guys will get a lot for from that. Yeah, I think they would. Awesome. Well, gentlemen, as we always say in the moment of insight, take massive action. Where are you going to change in your business? What are you going to look at? Are you really going to look at the data and the numbers, or are you going to just going to keep running things as they are? Now I get it. If your marriage is crumbling around you, it's hard to stare your business truly in the face. Fix that first. Fix home base, which is your home. 
fix that first, then come back to that business and start looking at what would happen? What would happen if my business 10 X, what would break first? That's a good way of starting guys. What would break first? If I gave you 10 times the customers today was the first thing that would break. And that's a good place to start and look at what that constraint is and alleviating there. Gentlemen, as always, it's a pleasure to be with you and we'll see you next time on the TPM show.